Thank you. Um, my name is Mike O'Connor. I'm uh, an industrial automation uh, person from history with my family, but I've also worked uh, in the uh, uh, internet industries uh, along with um, uh, ISPs, these sorts of things, uh, and as well uh, found early on that Linux and open source software was the solution to go to for almost anything. <laughs> The other person that works with me on this project uh, is Martin Ledbeater. Um, he's done most of the low-level coding. Um, he and I developed. We have a lot of feedback here. Uh, and Martin is um, uh, the uh, primary low-level programmer, uh, along with myself doing a little bit and uh, working with him to work out what was the best way for us to do what we wanted to do. Um, so, uh, LAPPROC is our GitHub um, repository. It has a number of projects in it, um, and they're listed here. Um, and I'll go through these as we progress through the talk. This project started uh, in 2012. Um, it was a Linux framework. Um, in the last year, it's uh, been ported across to uh, FreeRTOS and tested on the ESP32. It's under a BSD or a GPL license based on what other things we've had to include into it uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the community. Um, that proc is used today by my family business um, for the uh, controlling of wool sampling machines, um, which are a combination of hydraulic and pneumatic componentry, along with uh, user interfaces and those sorts of things. And it's a reasonably complex uh, field of, of sampling um, because no bale is the same. <laughs> They're all different from the rules point of view. Um, we designed it to work around uh, the uh, industrial um, hardware that uh, these sorts of things are required to use. In particular, EtherCAT is an absolutely amazing industrial control protocol. Uh, and uh, there are two separate Linux-based projects for uh, talking to this hardware, which is a good thing uh, from a diversity point of view. And of course, we have to talk to legacy protocols, Modbus, master and slave, um, TCP, I, TCP IP and uh, uh, serial. We have uh, what I think is a rather interesting little uh, tool we call device connector that allows us to connect to arbitrary raw TCP ports or to receive connections from them. Uh, and uh, that uses regexes to create packets of data that can get sent into the control language for interpretation and usage. Um, and we have a number of plugins in the system uh, for capturing stuff off of a web page, in particular video cameras and that kind of thing. And uh, we support uh, MQTT, which is an industrial, sorry, that's an IoT protocol. Um, and uh, uh, most of the open source projects use MQTT nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah. That's. Uh, the beginning of one of our machines, those are bales of wool. They're um, averaging at 180 kilos, but have a range of 120 to, well, technically a max maximum of 204, but uh, sometimes they get higher than that. Um, and um, that's the front of the machine. Um, that's uh, about uh, 15 meters or so wide. Um, and you can see in there uh, two separate um, Graphical displays, uh, those are uh, uh, the humid application that we have written in Linux. It's OpenGL based, uh, uses text files to configure the display, and the <coughs> clockwork, which we'll talk about in the future, uh, actually uh, controls those screens. So the internal status of clockwork moves those screens, displays data, all of those sorts of things. And that's looking down through the machine, um, which uh, gives you an idea of its uh, um, sort of complexity and whatever. Now, 
Clockwork. It's the language we use in LATPROC. Uh, it's uh, based on um, modeling of your action, not step-by-step uh, -step instructions like normal languages would be, you know, like C and like Python and all those sorts of things. Um, you describe the state of something. A door is open, a door is closed, or maybe it's opening, maybe it's closing, or maybe a glass is half full. <laughs> um, whereas programming is more like um, you're connecting these pieces of state machines together to create a set of actions. Uh, we think of sequences as changes between states, not steps from one action to another. Generally, our uh, action states, the actions we take inside a state, are actually quite small. Um, the language is rule-based, has automatic state selection, there are no loop statements, and we have very, very high code reusability. This is a very simple machine. Um, it has two states on and off. It's not an automatic machine. It has to be outside influenced to be set to a state. Um, and as said there, it's a, a machine is like a class or a template. And we would instantiate um, as many of these little machines as we would like to as per our needs. This here is a machine using a more traditional method of doing state-based programming, where you have two states that are not automated, but you have a transition table that says, based on an event, transition to another state. And in this case, you're transitioning from off to on and on to off whenever you receive an event called next. This is how you would normally look at state machines when you're programming them down in the net network code in Linux, they're a state machine, this is how they work. Whereas we look at things as called state monitoring. State machines are a comm technique, they focus on events and transitions. We state focus on states and their rules. So this here is a blinker machine and it has a when statement in it. And when statements, um, when true, and being the only event, sorry, only state, uh, you will transition to that when it's true. And what you'll notice there is that on and when self is off. So you'll actually only be in this state very, very short time, period of time because you go to on and say, well, I can't be anymore because I'm not off anymore. So you'll fall to the default state in this case. So it's a great way to go blink, 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 blink very, very quickly. This here is an example of a light. Um, lights uh, have a switch that turns them on and you want to be able to turn the light on. And so we've got a, a rule there that says on when switch is on. And we turn the light on and we stay in that state until somebody turns the switch off. Um, the set commands you see in there in the enter, on and off, are what actually then turn the light on and off. And uh, they would probably be, in this case, the raw output that would be doing that job. But it could be, in my case, I might say that there's some rules that make it so that you turn the light on, but you're not allowed to turn the light on because whatever. And so I'll have extra code that's a layer below that that actually interfaces to the real hardware. So we have a, I have a concept called guards which I use to protect against damage to machinery and that kind of thing. Um, this is a counting machine. Um, and because we don't have a loop or a while statement or anything like that, um, this is how we recreate that concept. Now, um, this would, when activated, literally just count up very quickly. Except there's actually a bug in that program there. Can anybody see what they think it might be? The problem with that piece of code there is you're idle, you'll transition to counting up when count is less than 10. You'll increment the counter by one from zero. How do you leave that state? 
the counter still continues to be below 10. So you're going to stay in that state and it never continues to count up. So um, what we do is we could do this. We could put an if statement in there that transitions the system back to the idle state after it's done the count up. Doesn't look the greatest and not the way we would normally do it. Instead of fact, the way we would do it is back to that self state chessing thing. So up when self is idle and the count is less than 10 and as a result you will transition to the enter up, you'll increment by one, you're not allowed to stay there because your state is now not idle, so you'll fall back to idle again and you'll count round again at very high speed. Um, these are examples. So, reuse of componentry. Um, we pass in parameters. There's a switch that we've passed in and we've passed in a light. So this allows us to reuse our little template for a light switch a hundred times in a building. And all it is is a configuration line, which I think is in the next, yes, which is in the next, but actually this actually does something more, so I'll go back. So um, each um, light switch monitors the states or properties of its links machines, and as a result, when the switch turns on, it turns on, and it turns on its output. What happened if you wanted to group an area? So we need to, you turn on a switch, you want to turn on some extra lights. Well, we have this list statement, and you can add extra things to a list. Um, list statements are actually very powerful. It's not, I don't have an example of it here, but we have a form of uh, like SQL statements, select statements, where you can select out of a list into another list, a list of things that match what you want to look at. So you get a list of a thousand lights and you want to deal with group two, you can select out of that list group two and then send a turn on command and all of the commands that you execute or you send to the list are then replicated to all the machines in this new list of yours. And it could. So very, very powerful. I use this within my own programming extensively. We have to grab and core bales in sort of ever rolling patterns. And so what I do is I generate that pattern, create it into a packed bitmap, transfer it to the particular machine that I'm dealing with, pull it back out into a list of flags that say these ones are zeros, these ones are on. And as a result, I can then pull out of those the position I'm at on the front and I'm dealing with the top of the bale. Uh, that's position one and two. Is there any work for this position? If there's not, loop again, is there any work for the next one? Is there any work for the next one? That's how you can create loops of, of jobs. Very, very powerful. Um, this here is a little example of, a, um, of one of our machines working and in the, for the purpose of actual fact, I'm looking at this uh, mechanism here that's standing in front of the bale there. Um, there's work happening up the top here. We're mostly dealing with the picture of the, um, so this lists up. So that there is a, what we call a bail gate. It has a state of down and a state of up, and it's instructed to lift itself up whenever um, this press is traveling down. And the way it does that is it monitors the press and says, well, the press is coming down. I better raise myself up. So I don't have to write special code. I just write that. It does the right thing. So, um, you know, and you can see there that uh, the machine's reasonably quick <laughs> at doing its work. Um, right. Does that work? How does it work? Oh. Right. So, uh, comparison of programming styles. Um, blinking LEDs is the traditional way within uh, little embedded hardware platforms to do a hollow world equivalent. So I thought we'd use that as our example. These two things here are um, how you would do that with some Arduino code and then with clockwork on an ESP32. Um, as you can see here, code's about the same length in this case. Um, so probably not a good reason to switch right now, is it? 
when we're going to add more LEDs. The complication gets a bit more complicated. Uh, what happens if you want different timers? Well, you have to create, start to create while loops that check to see whether the last time matches the, the correct time for the thing to turn off and all those sorts of things. Whereas within clockwork, actually I should go back and describe that blinking machine here. Um, although we have looked at that before. So this here is another one of the case of those machines which transition to a state and then fall straight back again. Um, so that blinks on, blinks off, except that we've added wait statements in the code to slow it down. So it enters the on state, it now does not re-evaluate that state for half a second. It's blocked, the machine is blocked. Um, and so to make this machine capable of varying time, we have um, added the ability to set a property in the blinker there. You can say wait underscore time 500, 350, 650. Um, and those properties, later on I'll mention it, but um, they could be, instead of hard-coded like that, they could actually be properties that you could edit using our persistence system. In actual fact, that code there is actually quite a bit longer. So if you go down here, you've got a lot more code to it. It becomes complicated. Whereas that stays quite simple. Although in actual fact, it can be quite a bit more simple. You don't need those wait statements. Instead, clockwork keeps a timer for every time there's been a transition from one state to another. It resets the time and it sits counting up that time or not really counting it up. Every time it's evaluated, it's looked at and we can identify how long it's been in that state. So this machine here will blink the same as the other one, but now it's not using a wait process. It's actually looking at the states. It has a, an event scheduler like a timing scheduler in the background, it receives an event saying, hey, I'm pretty certain your timer has expired. You probably should check it and see whether it needs to move to a new state. Um, so again, much more simple, shorter, readable. So um, from a tool's point of view, we have our EtherCAT daemon, which has dedicated code in it um, for talking to EtherCAT. We have Clockwork, which is just the daemon that would be used with Device Connector, MQTT, um, yeah, all those sorts of things to do the job of um, where you're not dealing with uh, an industrial I.O. product. Um, so, yeah. We have IOSH, which is our terminal shell. This allows us to describe in detail the state of a particular machine. Um, very, very useful for debugging purposes. And of course, Sampler, very, very useful for debugging purposes. It streams states and events uh, to disk or to terminal or whatever your particular requirements are. I mentioned persistent daemon. Uh, basically, we can say, as part of the, the instantiation of a machine or inside the code of the machine, I want this persistent. And what that means that is that it stores all of its properties in a separate process. Each time the daemon is restarted, it reloads all those persistent properties uh, so that anything you've set, say, say a door, when you walk up to the sliding doors, you want the door to open immediately, but you don't want it to close immediately. You will set a timer to say, well, I want you to close half a second after, they, after you stop sensing anybody. Say, this way, um, say in a shopping centre. You've always got people walking through the doors. You don't want the doors always as closing as merely somebody comes through because that's just inefficient for people getting in and out of the building. Um, my bus, as I said, it's uh, um, the, again, we say to Clockwork, make these uh, memory bits, properties, states, whatever, visible to the Modbus and they are you know, packed into the Modbus flat memory model. Modbus has no security, so you don't want in anything in it that you don't actually want to have somebody able to twiddle, uh, which is a big problem with standard industrial control systems because there is no way to do that. And uh, as I've mentioned, device connector, quite a useful tool for pulling in weight information off a set of scales or opening a USB port to an Arduino that's tending, sending you data. I had a, 
a fan that I ran on a, on a rack out, sort of in our back enclosed area and I'd monitor the temperature. The Arduino would send me the, the temperatures on a regular basis. I'd look at that and decide whether I wanted to turn the fan on. One way around to do it, but it was a test for my own purposes. Okay, iOS H. Oh, interesting. Well, unfortunately, it looks like the code for that's disappeared. Um, it's just here. Oh well, that's a problem. I can't show it to you. Um, well, maybe I can just quickly take this across like that. There we are. So that's a describe of a fan uh, that's actually used on um, the cabinet or one of our industrial cabinets. Um, that is the physical output. There's other code that will monitor the temperature of the hard drives and turn on the fan if they give a, get above a certain temperature. So we don't freeze them during the winter, but we want them to not get too hot during the summer. Um, and there's a lot of information in there about its um, yeah, uh, characteristics, basically. Um, so yeah, let's get this back here so I can see it. Is that going to work? Right. This is a um, very simple little piece of sampler code. Um, it's actually an example of this piece of code here that's monitoring this little CO2 sensor. Um, it um, also describes the way things work. So we have an idle state and an update state that's limited to every half a second. I misstated earlier in the week, it's half a second, not a hundred milliseconds. And um, yeah, you can see the state transitions there. Um, I can't emphasize how effective the describe tool and the sampler tool are for debugging. Um, I'm sure that all of you have dealt with the situation where you're adding print statements and log statements to things to try to understand what is going on in a piece of code. Because the debugger, hey, they're great, but they stop the code. And if it's a live thing in any form, it's useless to you. You can't debug it because you've stopped it. <laughs> um, very, very frustrating. This just changes your type into a diagram, a paradigm of debugging. Um, I was experiencing a problem with an old machine with new control only five or six weeks ago. My brother's over in Cara in the middle of uh, summer in a hot, hot, hot building, uh, and this old machine was playing up with code that should have worked on it because it was a direct copy of a machine we'd only done three or four weeks ago for an Adelaide customer. But old machines play diff up differently. And it turned out that um, an input sensor was flickering off for a split se second. And my guard was detecting that and stopping the machine for a split second. But then it's coming good again. And I had a small logic error that meant that instead of just stopping this mechanism so that we could find out what was wrong, it was keep going on, but it had got into a weird state and was smashing to the bottom of the machine and making a bit noise and not doing what it should have done. But finding it was like 100 bales, play up, 100 bales, play up. How do you find that? <laughs> because you're dealing with the real world, uh, not you know, SQL servers or something rather that really just don't have any inconsistency to them. Or it would say VoIP, same, because VoIP has that same problem where things are a little bit different all the time because of, uh, of latencies and these sorts of things. So I just set up Sampler, left it running, told them to call me when it next happened. They called me, took a copy of the file, and started grepping it, thinking, well, okay, the thing that played up was the grab head. What did it do? Well, why did it go from going down to retracted weight? It shouldn't do that, <laughs> you know? And so you expand out your search, and eventually you find it, and the eventually was 10, 12 minutes <laughs> once I had an example of the problem, uh, whereas uh, I've done that with PLCs and, well, bluntly, one time I got on a plane to go across and find the problem and still didn't find it until a piece of code that we'd written that would do the same sort of sampling for a particular type of PLC was partially working and suddenly I had a log and, oh, what's that turning off for? Because you can't see the information. So this is very, very powerful. So um, we have a user's interface, so we have a web interface um, and that was the tool that I used for a long time. Um, it's, uh, 
basically refreshes once a second or something like that with the current state of all of the, the things and you can you know, send commands to it based on the command interfaces that exist for any particular machine um, and you can see the status there split across tabs so you have all your inputs, you'll have all your outputs, you'll have your control machines, you'll have your guards and these sort of things. So if you think oh, it's a guard problem, you click on the guard tab and you'll see whether it's true or false and that kind of thing. Um, that changed a lot with Humid being developed. Uh, we have um, you know, different types of buttons that people can press, you know, to momentary toggles. Um, you've got labels, text, and you've got number entry fields. Uh, you can have as many screens as you like, 20, 30, 40, whatever is appropriate for the machine. So I will actually write code that writes our text file, that writes out all of the I.O. So I don't have to sit there manually laying out inputs and outputs into a big long list that can take hours and then you realise, oh, there wasn't enough room, so I've got to make them all a little bit smaller. Very, very annoying. Whereas you can lay this stuff out real quick. It's a text file, there's no version control problems because it's just push it into Git. <laughs> um, the really big thing uh, for me uh, was the time series data. Uh, that allowed us to identify a problem I've been having for some time that I couldn't see when I was doing it from the command line. Sometimes you need to see things visually instead of just be long streams of data. But, uh, I'm sure you've all seen that before, that graphing data actually makes a lot more sense than just numbers on a screen, and that helped a lot. Um, and that's what I was using, the bottom one, the scope, <laughs> that allows us to do a, a, a character-based graph, and it just didn't have the right scale. You just couldn't see it properly. Uh, so the time series graphing helped a lot. We have done uh, web-based web 3D models of the machines. We are able to simulate, so we can write the machine and write the simulation of the machine, and we can fully run that machine in code um, and do a fairly good job of identifying all of our logic errors, but it's a bit hard to truly simulate the hydraulic characteristics of the machine. So it's more about, well, I expect that cylinder to take two and a half seconds, so I'll set this up to extend it in two and a half seconds. Not, now could, this could be taken a whole lot further. There are tools for um, full-blown um, simulation of hydraulic circuits, pneumatic circuits, that kind of thing. So we could do it, but it's easier to do it on the real machine. It doesn't take that long to do. Um, but certainly the 3D model web, web 3D visualisation was quite cool for a number of problems that I was having um, in the early days. So um, that's all great and people might find that interesting but the thing that I'm sure all of you will be more interested in is the fact that we can run it down on a micro because um, writing code in micro Python, if you're a Python programmer, is probably not that hard but as soon as you want to uh, parallel program that with lots of different inputs and outputs, things get complicated again. Same problem in um, the Arduino C++ environment. You have to create some sort of just, uh, what's it called? Um, either preempt system or cooperative multitasking system. And that just gets complicated. So we've been able to uh, translate the clockwork logic into C code and then that's now compilable down to a, a um, free RTOS thread uh, or threads. Uh, and um, uh, we get quite good performance, although free RTOS with its one millisecond um, task switching architecture uh, does limit the performance a little, but still it's very good. Um, we only have basic functionality at this stage. So, example, there's no list function currently. So, we, but the implementation of those things is not going to take that long, simply because we now have the architecture. Getting the architecture was the hard part. Uh, we actually implemented um, NeoPixel LEDs. You know, it took barely a day to do it. So, it's not hard to do. Um, so, um, no string processing, no floating point. Uh, the NICE iOS interface is not currently developed, but Mosquito Pub Sub does a very good substitute. Uh, and Humid is not currently supported, although it could be supported via a redirect. So you could run Clockwork on a PC or a Raspberry Pi 
with, with Humid running on the Raspberry Pi and then use um, uh, the clockwork to clockwork for that communication and then MQTT out to the devices. And it wouldn't be that hard to implement, but it's a bit of a kludge, I suppose. Um, this is the build process. Um, at this stage, it's command based. You go into your project, uh, you say build with a negative S, or F, it will flash it, and this process happens. So the clockwork system exports the C, the generated C, the little kernel that we've written, um, and the, clock, the clockwork runtime all come together, object code, and it gets flashed. Uh, we've used a significant number of open source components, um, and uh, they have been, well, we couldn't have done it without it. So, um, yeah, that's it's the reason why you can do these sorts of strange and weird things, although I hope it's not strange and weird to everybody. <laughs> Hopefully they'll start using it. Um, as with all open source projects, there's probably enough, not, not enough documentation, although there is significant numbers of examples in the test directory. Um, and I am progressively working through all of my generic libraries and moving them into the Clockwork ESP project um, as per whether they make sense um, for what's going on. We will use multiple clockworks on machines, and when we do that, we have this ability to shadow the state of one machine across to the same machine on another, and we do have some problems there on occasions which uh, need to be worked on. Mostly it's the zero and Q library that uh, gives us the most trouble. Um, and there's a lot of features we'd like to add to the language over time uh, to improve things, to make things easier. So the, the addition of the list and the reference command was uh, you know, just a total change. It really, really made the complexity of code that you could write dramatically more complex, but also highly readable. So um, very useful. Um, applications to FPGAs. Um, that's an example there of a uh, FP, uh, a flip-flop. Um, and uh, you can see here that there's actually a very good correlation between the two uh, examples. This is a, a very common example that you'll find in FPGA code, and that's the clockwork equivalent. Um, which is a four-bit counter, um, and counters are used in FPGAs extensively. Um, so the point is here that uh, quite possibly, with the help of others, uh, we could actually implement a, a translator to um, Verilog, which might just simplify the process of programming FPGAs because you would have a more understandable language and we would be able to create a set of libraries the same with the way that uh, Verilog does with for all the functions you might want. Uh, but you would then be able to extend on them much more easily. Um, and in actual fact, um, uh, Martin was actually able to realise a simplification uh, when he wrote the, the clockwork code um, uh, because he could see what was going on much more easily because of the sampling. Um, you'll notice there, uh, there's a monitor dot value. That's, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but you can see that uh, the two results, that's the result from the FPGA's testing code, and that's the sampler code. And you can see that they match up. So you can test it on a PC and then, and then uh, run it on your FPGA. Uh, this is the piece of code that does the 4-bit um, the number. Uh, it uses uh, bit sets. So we're able to take uh, a list of four, uh, the four uh, F uh, flip-flops and convert them into a bit set, and that then, of course, becomes a number for us. So future development, we'd like to refine the language. More tools are needed. We'd like to move the compiling technology back up into the Linux land side of things. Um, 
and yes, we'd love help, love people that were interested in using it in whatever form that they found was interesting. Um, questions and comments. Um, and I also have a video that we could run in the background while we're doing that if you wanted to. This is um, the machine running. So, questions? Do we have any questions? Stick your hand up. Cool. Sorry? Cool. Hi, I'm just wondering if um, you could give a, a quick rundown of what the main differences between Clockwork and something like Epix and the state diagram system that it's got w would be. I'm a novice with Epix myself, so I'm um, I'm not not trying to be a pain at all. Ah, uh, well, I I know the name, and that's about it. What I can say is that the difference between um, our language in its use that I use it for and traditional state machines is that we don't use transitions. So there is no here's a list of states, here's a list of transitions on what event. So that means your coverage problem becomes much simpler. You can have a default state, you have a list of when statements and they are prioritised from the top to the bottom. So whichever one is true first in that list is the state you will transition from you know, to, from wherever you are in the, in the current process. Um, and those self is statements, so you can say uh, self is and your own name, and that's a way of locking yourself to that state for a period of time, or um, you know when self is a, another state name is a way to actually create those transitions, and they're very readable. Um, and so I will do things like the real world has this problem where you say turn on an output, but it takes time to do that. And so you will have a statement. So we have two when clauses. But for all intents and purposes, it's the same, except that the, uh, the self was, say, idle, is replaced with self is my own state. In the output is off state. And so until the output turns on, you don't leave that state. And so um, the equivalent is a when statement is like an or. Every when statement is like an or. And so you can have the same state name you know, state extending, state extending, twice, and those are that's an all statement against each other. So uh, my question was more sort of hardware related in that you've got this amazing bit of software and this amazing bit of hydraulic hardware, uh, and I've literally never seen anything that's easily controllable with you know, hydraulics like this just via a GPIO or a relay or something like that. Uh, have you got any suggestions of hardware to use? Because I can think of lots of things to do. Okay. So one of the very cool things you can do is you have a problem, if you want to try and control, uh, it's like 240 volt or three phase, you need certified equipment for that job, okay? Problem is a lot of that equipment's fairly expensive. But you can buy very cheap PLCs that are certified. So I'm not using PLCs in my case, but you can, for say building automation, buy a cheap PLC that has triax and those sorts of things in it. Don't load any code into it. Just give it a serial port or an ethernet port. Yep, and then run our Modbus master slave, depending on the particular requirements of that system, and list out all the I.O. points, and suddenly you've got certified control hardware, and it's cost you 500 bucks for 20-something points or something rather. That's right. We use, as I've said, um, a protocol called EtherCAT. This is um, a... It's becoming an industry standard, but they will use it with PLCs and uh, Beckoff will use it with TwinCat, which is a Windows-based control platform, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not going to use Windows for anything. <laughs> so, um, uh, as I've said, there's two libraries to talk to EtherCAT. Um, we're actually using Beckoff our hardware. I actually bought, my, personally, before we even started this, two sets of I.O. from two different manufacturers. I couldn't get the non-Beckoff stuff to work. 
because I didn't have enough knowledge. Um, and we got it, you know, and then now I know enough about it that we could have got that other brand, which actually had half the price of the gear we were buying. And that is actually is gear you could use that's quite cost effective for the same job I was talking about just before. There was a question up the back there. Oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any uh, tooling which could uh, take that definition language and just produce some visualization and diagrams and things like that? Absolutely. So um, if I. I thought there was actually one. Did we not see a. No, we didn't. We, so that was a drawing of the, the way the connection of the thing. So, yes, I do have. Yes. So you, the, you can tell clockwork to put out dia as the command line diagramic tool that gives you PNG files. Um, pardon? Yes, graph is the type stuff. Uh, so, you, yeah, so it'll give you all the relationships uh, between everything and that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, so you take your clockwork file and then they're scheduled by free RTOS and what's the kind of like scheduling so, um, of the machines? Currently today, uh, you'll have a thread for MQTT, you'll have a thread for the digital IO, you have a thread for the analog IO, that kind of stuff. Um, and they will message queue to the uh, clockwork thread. And so free RTOS has a one millisecond time slice, I believe it is. So what happens is that um, you will see, um, um, uh, the, the, the sampler, will, you'll see a number of things change and then you'll see a whole lot of clockwork logic and then you'll see a whole lot of things change. And that's because of the way the free RTOS system does the scheduling. Now that could be improved. Uh, I, I believe we could slow, speed it up. We could do things like um, use DMA reading of the I/O, that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that we could take ahead, but that requires people to be interested in it and um, and to work with us to make that happen. Great. I think we're done. Um, thank you, Mike. Not at all. <laughs>